morning. morning. Can you hear me well? All right. I'll try to be brief. Um, This is something that I kind of put together in my head this morning uh, from what I've been hearing over the week. Uh, you know, this, this entire week, all I keep hearing is, you're worthy of it all, you know? And as I was thinking about that this morning, uh, some thoughts came to mind, and I kind of wrote them down. You know, some people have this idea that God is this God that punishes that he's a mean God, he's trying to teach you a lesson, that he's a vengeful God. But what's the reality? All he, do, he does is loves us, you know? Uh, he first created the world, and Adam and Eve were created, and they had everything. Then they stopped trusting God, and the world got out of alignment. So what did he do after that? He gave us his son. And through his son, we gave salvation. And when his son came, what did he do? What yeah, what did he do? He gave us his spirit. So we're still receiving, regardless of the world getting out of alignment. <clears throat> so what does the spirit do? Well, Spirit gives us revelation, and in a lot of situations, he gives us the words that we have to speak according to God's will. So what do we do in return? Well, God gives us all of this without expecting something from us in return, but us being grateful to what he does, we give him all the glory, we give him the thanks, We give him all the praise, and we tell him that he's worthy of it all, because although we are flawed individuals that make mistakes every day and make bad decisions every day, he still loves us and gives us all these things. So it's kind of like a full circle that keeps going and going like the Energizer Bunny. Yeah. You know, just every day, just remember that everything that we have that is good comes from God. When we have something going on in our lives that is not good, let's just remember that he said, I'm going to take care of you so you don't have to worry. That's kind of what I have. Anyone has anything they want to share? Yes, Jody. Um, I just had a testimony. Yes.
to kind of go along with what you said, Jody, about being comfortable in, in him. Uh, there, there's been some things that I've been declaring for the past two years that God already took care of one last year, and the other one, he took care of it last week. Uh, and now my struggle is the devil is trying to get me to think that because I am trusting God the way I am, I don't care about my wife anymore. But I know where it's coming from, and I take it for what it is, yeah. nothing. So I just have to keep you know, reminding myself, every time that that thought comes to my mind, I just start laughing. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I, I know what you're doing, buddy. It's not gonna work. But yeah, just, I know what he's doing, and people are like, so what are you going to do? Nothing. I'm just going to trust God. Right. Well, the, yeah. People think that I don't care, but I do care, actually, very much. Anyway, anyone else? No? Okay, well, let's stand. Oh, Father, we thank you, Lord, for everything that you give us. We thank you, Lord, for creating this world for putting us in it, for giving us your son, Father, so we could be saved, so we could be redeemed. We thank you, Jesus, for giving us your spirit that dwells inside of us. That give us the revelation of yourself, Lord, of the word of God that became flesh, Father, to dwell among us and teach us and show us. And all we have to do, Lord, is believe in you and that you will take care of our every need, Father. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving us the words that we are to speak to ourselves, to others, to share the testimonies. And Father, right now we declare that every person that has been mentioned today, every person that is not here, that is in need of healing, right now, Lord, in your mighty name, Jesus, we declare that that healing is taking place in this very moment. Those that are in need of some sort of breakthrough, whether it's financial or relational, new job, anything, Lord, wherever they are in life, the situation that's not going through you, Father, we declare right now that that breakthrough is coming through. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives, for the calling that you have for each of us, that we may listen to you, Lord, so you can take us in the direction that you want to take us, Lord, so we can fulfill your purpose on this earth, Lord, that your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Things are coming. Amen. Amen. It's all good in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Mike. Um, <clears throat> forgot to put up any announcement. Later on this month, uh, on the 24th, we'll be up at Heartland Assembly of God up in North Side of Ankeny. Uh, the worship team has been asked, <coughs> the, the Eastern Gate House of Prayer has been asked to come back and do another two hour set uh, in their burn 24 7. They're going to do 24 hour. Uh, non-stop <coughs> worship of various groups from around Iowa. Uh, we've been invited back again to do, do, do another two-hour set. So uh, if you want to come, great. Just hang out, whatever. Um, pray for us as we go into a realm uh, that last time, I believe, uh, we started the pot a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, we're called yeah. to do specific things. And uh, just pray for us and what's going on. All right, well, let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. 
I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes and devours for my sake. And no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now in the salt. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of the servant. And Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, John and Toby, would you mind taking the offering, please? And Toby, can you say the blessing? Even the words that Toby spoke just rings into the atmosphere. And it throws me right into a song that I know the Lord has declared upon our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the year of the favor of the Lord. This is the day. This is the year of the favor of the Lord. This is the day. Whew. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We declare it, Lord, and we thank you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for what you're doing in what you are up to, Lord Jesus. And we appreciate what you are. We appreciate who you are, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And even as Brother John, Lord, was talking about earlier, that though this place may not be full, there's a fullness of your presence. And we may not be a body of people here that are overflowing into an overflow into another room, but your spirit is overflowing into this neighborhood. Your spirit is... Oh, Jesus, overflowing, and there's evidence of it. Because it's your ocean. Your ocean is vast. And, John, you didn't know if you spoke it or not, but the words you just spoke was the first song we're going to sing about, okay?
vast as the ocean, loving kindness as a flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he will never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal day. Crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the flood gates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Who his love will not remember? Who can cease to sing his praise? He will never be forgotten throughout his eternal days. Let your river flow. Lord, let your river flow from this place. Let the river flow from this place, O oh Lord. For you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy, Lord Jesus. You alone are worthy, Lord Jesus. You alone are worthy. Oh Jesus. It's not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty. There is freedom. Freedom. We cry freedom. We cry freedom. Freedom from addictions, Lord. Freedom from depressions. Freedom from sickness, freedom from financial burdens, freedom, freedom, freedom. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. As we worship you, Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. 
all. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. Jesus.
King of kings and Lord of lords you are. King of kings and Lord of lords you are. Cause you're my healer, you're my deliverer. darkness and brought me in the light take me from the darkness brought me in the light take me from the darkness brought me in the light you're worthy of my praise you took me from the darkness and brought me in the light you took me in the darkness and brought me in the light you brought me in the darkness you brought me in the light Something's being poured out in this place this morning, and I just want to be obedient to what the Spirit is doing. If you have not received the gift of baptism in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, worshiping in tongues, take a step of faith this morning. We're going to just stop for a few minutes and just worship in Him and love on him. The doors are open for you to receive that gift this morning, right now, in this place. So just open your mouth, those that have that gift, and just release it. And those that don't, just trust in the Lord. Just trust in the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
There's healing in his glory, church. There's healing in his glory. And there's deliverance in his glory. For he alone is worthy of all praise. As we gather around his throne room with the 24 elders, as they cast down their crowns at his feet, I had a vision yesterday when I was in here last night when um, some of the equipment that uh, was downstairs was being sold um, for preparation for some changes in the, on the platform in the sanctuary here and stuff like that. The Lord's funding through some of the equipment that we're not currently using. Uh, it's been a blessing. But I had a vision of the 24 elders that threw their crowns down. You think, you know, there's 24 crowns on the throne, around the throne, but there's not. There's millions upon millions upon millions of crowns of those faithful servants of days gone by, and they're just heaped up around this, this throne room, and it's so awesome looking. And your praises, even in this room this morning, are like crowns being thrown at his feet. We cast all these things down because it's not about us. It's all about him, for he alone is worthy. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And it reminded me of an older song when I was growing up. We don't get to do too much uh, anymore, but we're going to go ahead and run with it because it's in the atmosphere. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake, my soul, and sing. Lord, throughout eternity, Lord, 
Hallelujah, Lord. Throughout eternity, Lord. Throughout eternity, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Then we move into the words that Jody declared earlier in this next song. In the midst of all of darkness, we carry the light. Okay, these words are declared in this room. These songs were given in this room yesterday. Okay. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Time fades and days go by. Earthquakes and buildings falling from the sky. And yet a new day breaks, and still another reason why to live. Yes, Lord, we are the generation. We are the generation who will stand and fight. In the darkest of all the darkness, we carry the light. We are the generation who will stand and fight. In the midst of all the darkness, we'll carry the light. We'll carry the light inside. We'll carry the light inside. Fathers fail. And children hide. Hearts are broken from the hurts they have inside. And yet a new day breaks, and there's still another reason why to live. Yes, the Lord there is. Yes, there is, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We are the generation who will stand and fight. In the midst of all the darkness, we'll carry the light. We are the generation who will stand and fight. In the midst of all the darkness, we'll carry the light. We'll carry the light inside. We'll carry the light. Now's the time, it's the day to stand. Yes, it is. <laughs> Hearts can be mended by the power of God's own hand. Yes, it's a new day, <laughs> and it's time for the saints to shine. To shine. We are the generation. Who will stand and fight in the midst of all the darkness? We'll carry the light. We are the generation who will stand and fight in the midst of all the darkness. We'll carry the light. We'll carry the light inside. We'll carry the Light inside. We are the generation. We are the generation who will stand and fight. Come on, sing it out now. In the midst of all the darkness, we'll carry the light. We are the generation who will stand and fight. In the midst of all the darkness, we we'll carry the light. Sing it out. We are. We are the generation who will stand and fight. In the midst of all the darkness, we will carry the light. Sing it one more time. We are the generation 
who will stand and fight in the midst of all the darkness will carry the light. We carry the light, your light, Lord Jesus. We carry the light, Jesus. Carry the light, Lord. Carry the light, Lord. Sin 
God bless you all. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you, Mike and worship team. The testosterone up here is nearly palatable. Praise the Lord. Nothing to offset it this morning. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. I may be growing hair on my back right now. Right this second. Praise the Lord. <laughs> hey, there you go. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Appreciate everybody. Uh, brave in the cold, and uh, there's a lot of junk going around, obviously, because of the uh, because of the enemy. Praise the Lord, but uh, we're not giving in. Hallelujah. Keep on keeping on. Praise the Lord. Yes. All sorts of things. I told Sally the other day. <clears throat> I'm lactose intolerant. I won't tolerate it. I just won't put up with it, praise the Lord. I have nothing to do with it. That's what Sally just looked at me like. The dingo ate my baby. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. In my footnotes, you'll find a credit to uh, Seinfeld there. Appreciate everybody's testimonies this morning. Tremendous uh, in the way the worship team, uh, Mike seeking the Lord and, uh, and the Lord giving him the worship uh, music and songs to sing that is so perfectly fits into the testimonies and what the Holy Spirit, that's what the Spirit of the Lord says, that uh, the Spirit in us witnesses His Spirit. His Spirit witnesses the Spirit that is in us. And that's what happens. That's what we always like to see and, and experience. Amen. And I think it goes on uh, with the message this morning, with the things that were said. Uh, uh, different parts of this message will fit different things that were said this morning. Uh, I want to thank, again, all of you for sharing your testimony. You don't realize how important that is to one another. Sometimes we don't, you know, we think we're just saying something because we feel an unction to say it. And... Uh, you never know who's sitting next to you or behind you or in front of you or whatever that, that really needs to hear that. And certainly it bears witness with the Holy Spirit. So uh, sometimes we just need to say it because we feel like we need to say it. Amen. Just to be obedient, right? And I, I especially want to thank Dean for sharing your testimony and what God's doing in your life. And it's a battle. I came from that same background. Uh, most of you know that. I was involved with drugs and I was more than involved with them I, that was my life you know for, for a long time and uh, God is good he's faithful even when we fail even when we come up a little short from time to time he never gives up on us and there's no limit you know he said that he would he would restore the years that the locust had devoured and that the canker worm and so on and so forth lots of things in our lives that we feel like we can never get back but God will give us something even greater and our relationship with him and with other people. And uh, I would say this, uh, at 62, the best years are still to come, Dean. Amen. There's no question about it. Praise the Lord. God's got good things, amen, uh, that he has planned for your life, and they will come to pass. Hallelujah. They have to. God said it, and it must be done. Praise the Lord. So, hallelujah. Praise God. Let's, uh, let's I want to start out, you know, we... It's so easy, I, I was talking about last week, uh, how uh, 
it's easy to condemn yourself, and if you don't condemn yourself, believe me, you don't have to wait long to find somebody else who will. And if they don't, then just go to church, praise the Lord. And, uh, and they'll take care of it for you, hallelujah, if you haven't had enough guilt laid on you already. But Paul said he didn't want any part of any of that. And, uh, you know, a few weeks ago I was talking about nostalgia, how God's whole uh, plan is to bring us home, bring us back to that original condition, to that original place in him. We all came out from him. We're all going back to him, and we have been uh, given his spirit so that we are united one with him. That's what real nostalgia is. And we all, especially around Christmas time, I talked about that, how we, we all have our own little nostalgic kind of trips that we go on and thinking about when you were a kid or some special thing that happened to you. Or maybe it isn't Christmas, maybe it's some other deal, you know. Uh, I still, every once in a while, I'll go by my mother's house, which we sold a year or so ago. And uh, there's new people living there, and thank God for that. They've got a family, and it's great to see, you know, people living there and enjoying the house and so forth where I grew up. But there's a little nostalgia there. I can't go by it without remembering things I did with my brothers and my sisters and neighbor kids, and some of it was good, some of it not so good. But, I, you know, it's still, it, it reminds you of those things. And I think it was Wolf that said, you, you can never go home. Well, maybe in the natural that's true. But in the spirit, we have come home. We, ha we have come home to God. We are back where we want to be. That's that comfortableness that Jody was talking about. Uh, you know, it's comfortable at home. You know, you have to kind of be socially acceptable and correct and so on and so forth out when you're out. But when you're at home, you get to be you, you know, and you just, it's comfortable. You can just lay back, relax, take your shoes off, whatever, and, and it's okay. And that's exactly what God wants. He wants us to be comfortable at home with him. It shouldn't be the way religion has made it so stiff and, or bizarre that it doesn't fit any normal comfortable way that we would live. So that's part of what I want to talk to you about this morning. You know, we're always going to be challenged. We're always tempted to be moved, either by social conditions, uh, cultures, or religion itself, uh, tries to move us into a place where we see God a certain way, where God is this angry, dictatorial, as was also mentioned earlier by Roberto. Uh, and and it, it's easy for those thoughts, too, to pop up from time to time. That's where the real fear comes that Debbie was talking about. It isn't so much the fear of things. It's the fear that God won't do what God said he would do. I always say uh, my wife was a little fearful of flying the last time we went out to the, well, the last time we flew to Phoenix or to Arizona. Uh, I don't know when it was now, several years ago. But anyway, uh, she, she did not enjoy the, the excursion. She liked Tucson, I guess, is where we were that time. But, uh, but she didn't like the going and coming. And I always told her, I said, it's not a, it's not a fear of flying. It's a fear of dying. Praise the Lord. I'm not afraid to fly. I'm afraid the plane won't do what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Amen. So uh, there's always fears, uh, but fear isn't coming from God. Anytime we feel fear, we know that is an abnormal, uh, untrue feeling or experience that we're having. Again, I said last week, people get their feelings hurt. People say they have their feelings hurt, but the truth is your feelings can't be hurt. It's yourself. You know, you're protecting yourself. And the way we, we worry about things so much is about ourselves. Well, we've been crucified with Christ. We can relax. Uh, we've done all the dying we're going to do. Amen? This flesh may have to go away, but we're done dying. We will live forever. Who we are, our personalities, we'll know, each, we'll know one another. We'll, you know, in eternity. Praise God. So, uh, 
we need to know the truth because you get on the internet, you get on television, uh, radio, office, jobs. There's always somebody coming trying to put you under some sense of guilt or fear. You know, the you know, God's not gonna God's not gonna do this for you because you haven't done this for God or you haven't been good enough or you haven't done enough. I I can promise you, uh, God has proven to me uh, this grace because when I have failed Him miserably, He's blessed me. I mean, I I know there were times when I thought this cannot be right. This I must have gotten in the way of somebody else's blessing because I just didn't deserve this one. You know, I didn't. I was doing stuff I shouldn't have got blessed. But he just blessed me because he loves me, not because of what I was doing or not doing. And that's the, that's the idea and attitude that we have to have about God in spite of what anybody else says. And that's what I want this church, the, us, to know and to understand. God has given us, he, it's, he said it's for freedom, amen, that he set us free. It wasn't for bondage that he set us free. He didn't set us free from one bondage to give us another bondage. He didn't set us free from the, you know, all the cares and the, and the crises and everything in the world to put us into a religious system that would then hold us in bondage and make us feel guilty and ashamed and, and fearful and all of those things. It was for freedom that he set us free. We ought to be the most freedom or the most free people that there are. We ought to be the most liberated, the most happy, the most easy going, the most at ease, the most peaceful and contented people that there are. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So, with that, let's look at, let's begin here. I want to read two scriptures uh, from the book of Acts. Sheila, if you will, Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, first of all. Now I'm going to go backwards here, but only because of the context in which I'm talking here. So we're going to, we're going to look at first Acts chapter 20. And verse 24, Paul said this, he said, but none of these things move me, nothing. I'm not going to be moved by what people are saying, by what the world is doing, by what religion is trying to force on me. I'm not going to be moved, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. And here's the ministry. We all have this ministry. That's the ministry for everybody, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's what we heard here this morning. We heard ministry already throughout this service. We've testified to this gospel or to this truth of the grace of God. That's what Paul says. Nothing else is going to move me from this truth, from this reality, the grace of God. Amen? Okay, now let's back up to Acts chapter 17 and verse 28. For in him, why nothing moves me? Because it's in him that we live and move. Amen. Any, any moving that's taking place is because we're in him. Amen. We, it's in him that we live and move and have our very being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We are God's children. Praise the Lord. Okay, now let's go to Romans chapter 8 and uh, verses 14 through 17. So I'm not moved, I'm not frightened by religious teachings or, or, or people. I'm not against that. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not picking on I'm just saying I'm not moved by it. The only thing I'm living by is Jesus and the truth of his grace. And in fact, you can't separate him because grace isn't a teaching. Grace isn't a doctrine, as uh, most of us have all heard. Grace is a person. Grace is Jesus Christ. They're one and the same. Amen? So here, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. So you think about it. It's a, it's a contradiction. Because most of us have gone to church in our lives and been involved in religious activities that promoted one thing, fear. 
Fear that you weren't going to measure up. Fear that you had fallen short. Fear that God was going to judge you, that you were going to be in big trouble because you didn't do enough of this or you did too much of that or, or whatever it was. But we have been born again so that we are now spirit beings alive to God, connected to God. We receive that spirit, not of bondage again to fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We've been born again into the family of God. He's now our daddy. Yes. Amen. Abba, praise the Lord. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Amen. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Praise the Lord. Well, one of the things Jesus suffered was religious attacks. Praise the Lord. He was called a friend of sinners. He was, a, you know, against the, the law of Abraham, which was not true. He, he defined it perfectly. It was that their perceptions of that uh, uh, law and its purpose were skewed. They were just wrong. Praise the Lord. So, the, God is, is not about bad versus good. He's about lost versus found. Praise the Lord. You aren't good or bad being, uh, you know, children of God. In other words, you're not good at being a child of God or you're not bad at being a child of God. You just either are or you aren't. Praise the Lord. You're either lost and in bondage or you're a child of God. One of the two. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's look at Psalms 118 and verse 26. And then we'll look at the parallel scripture that's in the New Testament. Psalms 118, verse 26. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Look at this now. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Now, again, we've been talking about the home, you know, being at home with God, being comfortable with God. Now, that's what he tells you. We've been blessed out of the house of the Lord, from the house of the Lord. In other words, we've been blessed. Praise God. All right, now in... Uh, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 9. The multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. This is the fulfillment of that prophetic word that was given in Psalms. Amen? And that's what it means to be free. God loves you just because he loves you. It's, it's coming home. Praise the Lord. That's what it means to be really free. Praise God. Jesus shares everything that belongs to him with us. And that truth answers the core question, who am I? Praise the Lord. We are children of God. We are the beloved of God. We are his heirs. John chapter 8, let's go back there to verse 32 through 36. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Praise God. Amen. So it's like the prodigal. Everybody here knows the story about the prodigal son, right? He makes some terrible choices. They looked good when he made them. He wanted his stuff. 
He wanted to enjoy his life. He wanted to party, and he didn't want to be kind of bugged by his super religious older brother or even his father. I think he just didn't want to embarrass his father, and he didn't want to have to deal with his brother. So just give me my stuff, and I'll go do my own thing. And so he did, but he realizes at one point this bondage of self-effort. If we use this as a metaphor for religion, and that's what Jesus was doing when he told the story because he was telling it to these religious people. He wasn't telling it to unsaved people or, or quote-unquote people that were sinning or, or failing. He was telling it to the people who were claiming to be righteous, the Pharisees. Praise the Lord. So here's what he's telling him. He said, he, he, this prodigal son realized at one point that self-effort was bondage. He wasn't getting anywhere. He was a captive, you know. And so he says to himself, self, why don't you just go home and work for dad? But here's the problem. You can't work for dad. You're an heir. That's, what, that's the story that Jesus is trying to tell us. And religion has taught us a totally opposite teaching. But he's saying... Here's my choice. Because I'm a person who wants to, you know, uh, my own self-effort to justify myself, I'll go home and I'll work for him. And you can't do that. Because heirs don't work. They're in charge. They're kings and priests. They're a holy generation. Amen? They are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? Only lost or found. Only free or in bondage. You can't mix the two. They're one and separate things. They're totally individual things. Praise the Lord. In John chapter 8, where we've been reading, Jesus addresses another bondage, religion, which is just a kind of a prodigal. It's this sense of having some control. The truth is, it leads people to think they can control God. Oh, you say, no, 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 that's not true. But it is absolutely true because I think that if I do such and such, then God is bound to do this. Because now God owes me, I was really good. Right? So that mindset is actually idolatry. It's thinking that we can somehow control God. The truth is that it leads people Amen. To believe that they can self-correct their rebellion and then you'll be acceptable to God. Praise the Lord. That's, the, that's Religion is a type of prodigal. But if we correct our own standing like a prodigal, don't we have only ourselves to thank? I mean, if I fixed my stuff, if I got my act together, if I got it all right, what did I need God for? Yeah. Thanks. Good job. You did it. You overcame it. Praise God. See, there's no, there is no real gratitude in religion. If we believe that we live under a God who won't accept us until we're fixed, then we don't have a father. We have a judge. We don't have an Abba. Amen. We have a judge. We don't have a Savior in Jesus who is all sufficient. We have a Jesus who died for us, but wasn't quite able to bring us home. Praise the Lord. Thankfulness, in spite of what you might have heard, is not a fruit of religion. Praise the Lord. John 8, 28, Sheila. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he 
and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Praise the Lord. So, uh, you know, a lot of religious people, they, they feel a sense of indebtedness to God, but they confuse that with thanks. They confuse their sense of indebtedness with thankfulness. They learn about Jesus dying on the cross, and they're filled with the knowledge that they've got this huge debt. And religious people are committed to paying back the debt. Most everything you hear in a religious service is about your obligation to repay, to do right, to be justified, to be sanctified, to do something to put yourself in a position where God can be pleased. They believe that if they do the right things and don't do the wrong things, then they'll pay back Jesus and fulfill their obligation. That's why it's never ending. That's why, on the one hand, they tell you you know that you're saved, but on the other hand, they're telling you all the time that you don't ever really know until you're dead. And then get ready for the big surprise. Hopefully it's not real hot. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. So, look at, Let's look at this. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Now, we already know what the truth is, right? Because Paul told us the truth or the gospel of grace. So, what happened to these Galatians? Who deceived you? Who bewitched you that you wouldn't obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Having begun this thing by grace are you so stupid now to think that you're going to perfect it by self effort by the law by the do's and the don'ts all right look at let's look at john chapter 8 uh, verse 31 and 32 then said jesus to those jews which believed on him if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. What's his word? Grace. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What's the truth? Grace. It's all grace. Yes. Yes. Jody is saying, like all of us, we want to hear God more. The more comfortable you are with God, the more at ease you are with yourself, the easier it is to hear God. Because he's talking all the time. But most of the time we don't think he's talking to us because he's too nice. We only think he's talking to us when he's mad. Well, most of the time it's not him that's talking to you. It's your own conscience that's thinking he's mad. If, you, if we ever get this grace this real revelation of grace deep down inside of us, we will be free. We will know the truth, and that truth will make us free. No longer bound to, did I have a good day, did I have a bad day? Every day is going to be a good day in Jesus, no matter how you respond to that day, no matter if you do everything right that day or do everything fouled up. Amen? You'll be less likely to be the foul up if you know that God is with you, no matter what. You can be comfortable with God even when you fail. He loves you the same. He loves you whether you're failing or whether you're succeeding. He just loves you. He wants you to come home. The prodigal son thought he had to do a bunch of stuff to get home. He didn't. The father didn't even let him give him his speech about what he was going to do. He just runs up and gives him a big hug and starts giving him all his stuff back. 
praise God. He didn't put him to work in the field immediately. He didn't say, get out there and join your religious brother who was busy working and complaining that he never got a party. And he said, hey, the party's been going on all along. All you had to do was come and join in. Well, you were too busy working to earn it to receive it. Praise God. See, the great, the great invitation of the gospel is that all of us prodigals get to come home because we are the beloved of the Father. That's the good news. It's an invitation. Come on home. Whatever your condition. We, we, hear, we hear him say that, but we know it's not true. Just as you are. Come. Just as you are. But don't leave just as you are. <laughs> you better leave somebody else. Hallelujah. He says, come as you are. Just keep coming as you are. I love you. I love you. I, I embrace you. With all of your mess, I got stuff for you. I want to bless you. I want you to, I want you to know how loved you are in spite of you. That's God. That's the truth of God. John chapter 10 and verse 9. Jesus says, you want to come home? I'm the door. I'm the front door. I'm the side door. I'm the back door. I'm the sliding glass door. I'm the door. I'm the way in to home. I'm the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. He'll go in and out and find pasture or provision. He'll be comfortable. He'll be at ease coming and going to the Father, receiving, hearing, Responding, interacting. Yes. Amen? Verse 10. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I'm come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Glory to God. Amen? Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Living an abundant life, living abundantly, living fully, living freely, living completely comes from the freedom of this radical infusion of God's grace from nothing else. Praise the Lord. He's the door. Come in and help yourself. I'm always saying, you know, uh, uh, my kids come to my house. They don't need to say, hey, can I, uh, my grandkids are the same way. I have to watch them once in a while because they'll grab stuff that's in the refrigerator that they shouldn't be having. But it, whatever's in there is theirs. It's not like, get out of the refrigerator, you know. Help yourself. Just don't leave the door open. I mean, after you've been there eight times. You've pretty much got memorized now what's in there. You don't need to stand there and go, let's check the list here again. No, just go get what you want. It's okay. You don't have to feel uncomfortable about that. What's mine is yours. It's, it's your house. Yeah. Right? right? Now, that's the way God is. He said the shelves are stocked. The fridge is full. Whatever you want, help yourself. It's yours. It's your inheritance. Yeah. You don't have to feel uncomfortable. Wow. Amen? You want to watch TV while you eat? Go ahead. It's okay here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, praise the Lord. Yeah. This is not, you know, Emily Post. We're not worried about offending somebody's social delicacies. Amen? You want to use paper plates so you don't have to do dishes? Fine with me. It's okay. Right? Don't have to get out the china for me. Just give me something to put it on. If it's possible, I'll eat it off a napkin if it means I don't have to do dishes. As long as it doesn't have gravy. I'm good. Amen? No, it's nothing, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having nice table settings and china and all that stuff. But you know what? That's for company. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's for guests. That's for people that don't really know us. <laughs> Amen. We're comfortable just eating together. If it's a coney, you know, a chili dog, or filet mignon. No, it's catfish, 
or lobster. It's all good. Praise the Lord. That's what God's saying. Just relax. Be comfortable with me. This is your home. Hey, he's in us. We're in him. We're sharing a home here. I don't know about you, but I've had some roommates over the years. My youngest brother was the worst. And I suppose he thought I was the worst because I'm kind of compulsive. And he was far from compulsive. <laughs> we lived in Madison, Wisconsin for a while. It was a nightmare. I finally had to run away. <laughs> I, was, I was only about 30 at the time. <laughs> I was actually, on, I was in my 20s, but uh, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't take it. We worked together. We, we, <laughs> he managed a Jose Taco restaurant. Yep. Don't tell me about Hispanic roots. I know you're Puerto Rican, but to us, you're, you know, you know what I'm saying. Tacos, right? I mean, don't you get that all the time? Yeah. Jose Taco. The only thing good about it was I got to sneak in to see Lou Reed and uh, a few other blues and jazz singers because there was a, a whole theater right next door. This is on on the main street there, straight street in Mad City. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and we lived up by the, by the, where the fraternities and the sororities were, but it was just houses that had been chopped up into apartments, little apartments. It was a mess, because Dan was not one to clean up much after himself. He was, it was like the odd couple on steroids. <laughs> So I finally I had to run away and get a place of my own so <clears throat> so I could be miserable by myself. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm just saying it wasn't like home. For either of us, we made each other uncomfortable. We loved each other, but we just didn't want to live with each other. God wants us to be comfortable. He adapts. I'm not saying he changes I'm saying he adapts. I'm not saying he, he winks at sin or that he doesn't care about sin. He's dealt with sin. He's already dealt with it. He's not seeing it. Praise God. See, this is a grace infusion that he's given us. Grace that sets us free from rebellion and religion. Even though we still are rebels at heart. And it invites us into God life, into eternal life, into an acceptance. Amen? 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. And this, this goes to what Debbie was talking about, but all of us are thinking about from time to time. You know, I have some stomach issues from time to time, here recently especially. It's not the flu or anything, it's just... I don't know what it is. But the first thing the devil says, oh, it's, it's cancer. You know, you know somebody else that had opened them up. Oh, they're full of cancer. Sew them up and throw them in a ditch. Praise the Lord, they're done. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm not laying awake nights fearful, you know, worrying, but I can't lie and say the thought doesn't come. I mean, we all do. I mean, the more and the more you're exposed to disease and situations, the more you think about it, the more you think, maybe that's what I got, you know. But there is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment, and he that feareth is not made perfect in love. So the reality is religion promotes fear. It's always pointing out the cancer always pointing out the sin, always pointing out the failure, always pointing out the abnormality by their standard. It promotes fear. But God is love. Love isn't just an attribute. It is God. Perfect love, that's God. It casts out fear. Amen? 
It drives out fear. Why? Because fear has to do with punishment. Praise the Lord. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. In other words, they don't understand God. Now, I'm not saying just because you've, a fear comes that, you know, you don't understand God. I'm saying living in fear, living in bondage to fear, living in a place of uh, unsettledness is not really understanding God not really knowing God, never being comfortable in your own home. My mother used to say it like this, wait till your dad gets home. Yeah. That's the way we live. Yeah. We're waiting for dad to come home all the time. We know he's got the big hand. Yeah. He's got the belt. He's got the whatever the punishment might be, it's coming from him. And it's going to happen in that house. Praise the Lord. What God is saying is, there's no more of this, wait till your father comes home. I can't wait for father to get home. Amen? Because I'm not afraid he's going to punish me. I just can't wait to get home and get on his lap. I can't wait to get comfortable. I can't wait to play a game with him, to do, you know, just have a conversation with him. I can't wait to be with dad. Praise the Lord. And the more we understand that, the more we realize we can be at home with him all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, all the time, anywhere, everywhere. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Romans 8, uh, verse 15. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. Praise the Lord. That's just a refresher. Yeah. You didn't get it the first time. Praise the Lord. Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. This is after you've been born again. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Right? Amen. Praise the Lord. People that are religious, I'm not saying, you know, I'm just using the, the typical, what we know of as a definition here. They're not free. They are in bondage. And they want you in bondage. Because people that are in bondage don't like looking at people that are free. If you're in jail, you may want a cell with a window. But you're not liking the people that are out there running around partying. You're just wishing you were out there with them and feeling cheated that you're not. They just didn't get caught. That's what you're thinking. You know, they, they, I didn't do anything any worse than them. I just got busted. You know, I just got caught. Praise the Lord. John 16, verse 33. We're going to have to pray for Sheila Carpal Tunnel. Praise the Lord. <laughs> will not come upon those wrists. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 1633, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now I was born again in a holiness church. I mean, some of you all know what I'm talking about. You've been in the same ch church. Loved the people, loved the, my pastor. But I'm telling you, there were very few nights that I went to sleep peacefully. I went to sleep checking that list and knowing that I'd missed a bunch of them. Amen. There wasn't a whole lot of peace. There was a lot of anxiety and, man, crying out and pleading the blood and praying all night. and Nothing wrong with that except that my motive was simply to keep God's wrath from falling on me because I knew that I wasn't doing everything I was expected to do. I wanted to do it, but I found myself incapable of doing it. It made me a hypocrite. That's what religion will do. And that's how Jesus identified the religious people. You snakes, 
You hypocrites. You know, you search the whole earth to find one person to, to proselytize or convert, and then you make them a twofold son of hell because you won't enter the kingdom. How do you get into the kingdom? By grace is the only way you can get in. You won't enter the kingdom by grace. You're trying to work your way in, and you won't let them in because you're going to give them the same standards and rules and demands that you're trying to place on yourself. This isn't hate religion. I, I don't, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in us being free. I'm interested in us knowing so that when somebody comes along and tries to tell you or put you into some kind of guilt trip or bondage, you can tell them, hey, I'm free. I am free. Thank God. I've come home. If that's what you want, God bless you, and, and I'll pray that you can do it. But don't come trying to put me under that same junk. Because I've seen the light. Praise God. Love confronts fear. Doesn't run from it. Doesn't hide from it. It pushes back when fear comes. The Holy Spirit is our seal, the Scripture says. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. In other words, we have been guaranteed to make it all the way through. It secures our place in God's family. Praise God. The world that we live in is a world that continues to try to deceive us into fear. Even when they're trying, when they claim to be trying to do something good for you. It's amazing to me. I watch these uh, medical, uh, not medical, but uh, uh, advertisements, you know, commercials for different drugs, pharmaceutical, you know, medicine. Now, it, obviously, they're telling you that it's to, it's to make you better, to do you good. It's like religion. It, is, it reminds me of a religious commercial. Now, here, this is going to this is going to make you feel so much better. But there are some side effects. And I would be, you know, be wrong for me just not to tell you that there are some side effects. So this thing will cause the rash on your elbow to go away. However, it may cause permanent liver damage, <laughs> loss of hearing, death, blindness, uh, lame in both legs, and you could possibly grow a tail if you use it for more than 14 days in a row. But it'll take care of that rash. And that's kind of what religion does to us. It says, here, here's your ticket to heaven. Now, <laughs> there are some problems that if you don't do this, this, and take it just the right, you know, then you could end up busting hell wide open, uh, you know, and taking your family and everybody with you, and it's, you know, there's side effects, there's consequences. And all of a sudden, the good news don't sound so good. And you're thinking, maybe the condition is better than the cure. And that's why a lot of people don't come to Jesus. Because they already got bondage. And they're not looking for more. They're looking for who will set them free. Praise the Lord. What religion does is cause us to have these feeble attempts at holiness despite the fact that we are rebels. Praise the Lord. It's the prodigal. John 15, verse 16. You haven't chosen me. I've chosen you. This is God. We didn't choose him. We might have thought we did, but we didn't choose him. He chose us. We wouldn't have ever come to him if the Spirit hadn't drawn us. Nobody comes to God except the Spirit draws him. So he chose us. And he ordained us that we would go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit would remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Now, let me ask you something. He's the vine, we're the branches. Do branches ever bear fruit disconnected 
from the vine. No, so the branches do not produce fruit. They just bear fruit. And that's what God's telling them. It's not your job. Don't worry about it. Just understand who you are in Christ, and the result will be fruit. It'll be produced. And you don't have to labor to do it. You just have to understand who you are and what you are. You are a child of God. A child of God is going to bear God fruit. It may not look like God fruit to the church because their definition of fruit isn't always the same as God's. Praise the Lord. What happens? Your fruit will remain, and whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I, I understand that in Jesus' name, that's fine. But religion has turned that into the rabbit's foot, you know, the lucky piece or something. And the truth is, you have been born again, and you now bear the name of Jesus. You're not Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. But you are the offspring of God. God sees you as Jesus. So when you come to him from that position of grace, he hears your prayers. And he answers your prayers and gives you what you ask. You can say in Jesus' name all you want to. If it was just saying in Jesus' name, the devil believes, but he's not getting prayers answered. Right? I mean, anybody, you could go out here and, and say, you know, well, if you just pray in Jesus' name, well, they can pray in Jesus' name from now until Jesus comes. And they're not getting anything moved in terms of just using that name. But once you've been born again, you've been born into that name. You now bear the name of your father. Now you say, well, Jesus isn't the father. Well, wait a minute. The scripture says, and you will call his name. Right? Jesus. Heavenly Father. Prince of Peace. He just gave him a name that's above every other name. I'm not debating Trinity here. I'm just saying Jesus came to reveal the name of the Father. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. He chose us. He came for us. Unless we were drawn by the Spirit, nobody comes to the Father. Well, God keeps coming after us. He just doesn't make an initial thrust, you know, or initial push to get us. He continues to come after us even after we've come to him. Even after he's chosen us and we choose him, he continues to come after us. It's a continuous pursuit. He comes after us with salvation. He comes after us with redemption. He comes after us with relationship. Because how many of you know we got saved? I didn't have a, a, a much of an understanding of redemption. I didn't have much of an understanding of salvation. Salvation is everything. I, I just thought, I, I'm not going to hell. Praise the Lord. That's great. But that's not all salvation. Salvation is my healing. Salvation is my deliverance. Salvation is restoration in all sorts of ways. That's, that comes over awareness, a, a revelation through the relationship. I never thought much about the relationship. I thought, he's the boss. I'm the employee. I don't have a relationship outside of that master-slave mentality. But the thing is, when we choose slavery, he brings freedom. When we choose sin, he brings forgiveness. When we choose bondage, he brings deliverance, salvation. And we make those choices every day because in the flesh we're still rebels. But in the spirit, we are children of God. And that's who he relates to. That's how he sees us. And that's how he wants us to see him.
So you say, well, what does it look like to step into this, this freedom, this abundant life, this life of abundant freedom? What does it look like when this thing is offered by grace and we step into it? After all, you know, we're, we're still just human. We are ordinary humans. Most of us would say, I'm, it doesn't get much or, more ordinary than me. I mean, as a human. Okay, so there are some weirdness about me. I understand that, but I'm talking about ordinary, not bizarre, just average, kind of. See, the thing is, nothing in this ordinariness changes the miraculous reality of God. And again, this is what Debbie was talking about. Mark uh, chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now, here's where we've made the mistake, I think, sometimes in Pentecost and charismatic circles. Uh, we get too freaky, I mean, for other people to handle. <laughs> you know? Now, I can get freaky. I can, you know, shout, and I do, you know, and I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying, but sometimes the way we present ourselves to, to people who aren't into that is just bizarre. It's just unnerving. It's just frightening. So what I'm saying is in this, in our ordinariness, it has nothing to do with the miraculousness of God. I can be absolutely ordinary and experience the miraculous of God. Again, I'm not putting down demonstrative worship or, or you know, spiritual responses to God. But I'm saying you can be as ordinary as dirt and have miraculous experiences in God. You just have to be conscious of God. Amen? That's what Jesus is talking about there. We simply neglect to see that within this ordinariness is God. And what we see is just ordinary stuff. God's there all the time. Yes. We don't see the miraculous because we're looking for the spectacular yeah. instead of the supernatural. Yeah. I've seen God do supernatural things in the most ordinary circumstances. I got healed. I, you all know this, but I'm just saying it. I got healed of hepatitis C under the most ordinary kind of circumstances. I mean, I would confess the word of God, but I got to tell you, when I was walking that bike path and I'm confessing what the word said, you know, that by his stripes I was healed and so on and so forth, I wasn't having shouting fits. I was trying to dodge dog crap and other bike cyclists and joggers and dog walkers. I couldn't afford to be in the spirit, <laughs> quote unquote. You know, I mean, I had to be conscious of my surroundings. Praise the Lord. You know what I mean? But he healed me. I'm going to the VA. You won't find a more carnal place than the VA hospital. Believe me. They're not into Jesus, Jehovah, Yahweh, or anybody else. Uncle Sam, and that's it. And when that doctor had to pile up all of my charts and records and say, I don't know what's going on here, Nathan, but uh, we can't find any hepatitis C in you anymore after telling me week after week after week for over a year, here's what this test says, here's what that, you're going to have to have a liver transplant, you're going to have to have this, you're going to have to have that. It was, I didn't feel goosebumps before they called me up there. I felt them after they called me up there. Yeah. Praise the Lord, because I knew what was happening, even though they didn't. But it was ordinary stuff. But God was working in all of that ordinary stuff every day. It wasn't like he just showed up that one moment. He'd been involved in it from day one. It's true when we get breakthrough in any area of our life, whether it's healing, whether it's deliverance, whether it's financial, whatever it is. God is involved. He cannot help but be involved because he's in us. It seems ordinary because we're not 
conscious of the extraordinary, of the supernatural that's happening all the time. Praise the Lord. Romans 10, uh, chapter 9 through 11. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. He doesn't do anything to be righteous. He believes. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Well, that's what we do every service when we read those scriptures. We're not just not just wrote, it's we're trying to agree with the word of God and say what God says about it. We're confessing that to be true, right? For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That word ashamed there actually in the Greek is translated, will not be disappointed. So the scripture says, whoever believes on him won't be disappointed. Now let me put that to you another way. Whatever you believe, is what you receive. So if you believe God is angry and judging and critical, you're not going to be disappointed. That's what you're going to think. That's what you're going to feel. That's how you're going to react. But on the other hand, if you believe what the Scripture says, that He's a loving God, He's a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God of love, a God who cannot, He just can't withhold Himself from blessing you, then you're not going to be disappointed. I've said it a lot of times, but it's still true. Our perception of God says a whole lot about our responses to God and our responses to other people. Praise God. So here's the deal. When this subtle unbelief creeps in, what's it doing? It's inviting us to live a reduced life. It's inviting us to settle for something less than what God is. It's inviting us to be disappointed. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 15. This is the last one. 2 Corinthians 3, 15 through 18. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So whenever the law is read, there's a veil. They can't see clearly. They don't see supernatural. They see natural. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, so when you turn from the law to the Lord, the veil's taken away. So when you look from law to grace, all of a sudden, you can see. You can see the supernatural. You can see the miraculous, right? Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, liberty and freedom. Praise God. Now, I don't make believe like a, like a little kid. Nowhere are we required to make anything up. We are required to pay attention in a new way. To see not through the veil or through the lens of fairy tales and make-believe, but through the lens of redeemed imagination. Now, we think, of, we say imagination, we think that means pretend, that means fakery. No, I can imagine any truth I want to. You understand what I'm saying? Imagination doesn't mean it's not real. It just means it's not tangible. You're just imaging it in your mind. Right? So I don't see through the imagination of a child or through the make-believe. I see through the imagination of a redeemed child of God. Are you with me? Amen? Let, let, me, let me use a scripture here. I, I said I was... Wasn't going to use anymore, but I lie. Uh, let's look at First Chronicles, Chronicles, Old Testament, uh, twenty-nine and verse eighteen. And I'll show you what I mean here. About O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, 
Keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. Praise the Lord. So I imagine God's healing breaking through. It's not make-believe. I'm imaging it. I'm, I'm imagining a truth. He says, I'm going to put this in your heart. This divine imagination. Not imagination like the world has that's fake and phony and, and deceptive and just make-believe. I'm going to put divine imagination in you so you can image the reality, the truth of what God does. This is all part of being home. This is all part of being a child of God. This is all part of not being in bondage, but being set free, being in liberty. At liberty to image the truth that will set me free from sickness, from disease, from poverty, from any bondage, any kind of lack. On my refrigerator, I've got, you know, faith is simply looking in the face of defeat and claiming victory. Yes. Looking in the face of lack and declaring abundance. Yes. That's what faith is. Faith is simply agreeing with what God says. Faith is simply imagining the divine rather than... I mean, come on. The doctor says this, 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 and this. What's he getting you to do? Imagine bad crap. I'm imagining this could really be serious. Right? Well, God's saying, use your divine imagination and see it the way he says it is instead of the way the doctor said it was or the way the, the, the priest said it was or the preacher or the, whoever it is. See it according to my mind, my imagination. I place that in you so that it'll keep you. Praise the Lord. I imagine healed. I imagine God's provision breaking through this temporary material life. Because God is eternal. Yes. Hallelujah. And in imagining, I'm called into the realness of God. And that God life that's in me. That's what we're doing when we think on God. We're using divine imagination, and it brings me in to that reality. I mean, how many, don't you know that? I mean, when, you, when you're praying about something, believing for something, don't you, all of a sudden, you don't feel, you feel kind of crazy, like, I mean, I'm saying you're believing something. All of a sudden, you believe it. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you didn't believe it, I mean, you might have believed it, but it wasn't consciously believed. It was just some tenant. It was, a, it was a teaching. But you get into a place where you just, well, I do believe this. I do believe this is going to happen. I do believe this can be. I do believe that that can be. Why? Because I'm, I'm aware now. I'm more conscious of this God life. I'm more conscious of God's reality, of God's truth, than I am of the world or the truth that, that religion or, or life has been trying to stuff down my throat. Praise the Lord. Without this imagination... Faith doesn't have any place to work. Uh, come on, you know this, because if you're, if you're just sitting there being fed what the doctor says, because I've been down that road, or what the banker is telling you, you can say, I believe, but you don't really believe. I mean, you're struggling with the, too much information that is contradicting your revelation. Right? So if I don't have faith, in other words, if I don't agree with what God says, there's no place... There's no place for, if I don't have the imagination, I should say, to think on things the way God says it, then there isn't any place for my faith to work. My faith becomes fear. Right? This imagination is a powerful thing. Because when I, without this imagination, I'm, I am reduced to works, to tasks, to effort, to just doing stuff to try to make something happen. Amen? But here, in divine imagination, there is a framework. There is a world. There is, he calls it a kingdom. Praise the Lord. In which God reigns. Wherever I am. 
in any situation and in circumstance. And in that realm, in that kingdom, in that divine imagination, is always the continuous possibility of him breaking through into my life situations, my circumstances, my relationships, my mess. Praise the Lord. Because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And that's why he says, look, folks, you're in this world, but you're not of it. You're here. You're exposed to it. This is, this is the troubles that Jesus dealt with. His sufferings. His challenges. But be of good cheer. I've overcome it. And if you'll remember that just because you're in the world, you don't have to be of the world. Your imaging can come from another kingdom. Amen? Amen. And when I do that, I see that I've been set free. That I've been brought into the Father's house. That everything he has is mine. Healing, prosperity, deliverance. It's all mine. It's my inheritance. I'm comfortable with God. God's comfortable with me. He says it's all here. And in that moment, I am fully alive. Why? Because I got nothing to fear. I don't have to recoil. I don't have to withdraw. I can boldly come to the throne of grace. I'm living life, amen, to the max, to the completeness and to the fullness that God has declared we are to live it. I'm living abundant life where there is no lack, where there is nothing taken, nothing withheld. Nothing to fear. My inheritance is all around me, and I'm home. Yes. Give the Lord a hand clap. Yes. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So let's just keep that imagination working. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. You see, that's why there is no age. I mean, obviously, there's no age in eternity, but I'm saying even in this world, our imagination is what limits us. Yeah. If you think of yourself as an old, decrepit, you're going to be old and decrepit, yeah. you know? But if you don't think of yourself that way, even though you may look that way to other people, <laughs> amen, you don't feel that way. You're expecting good stuff's going to happen, something positive, something really powerful, amen? Yeah. So I was joking about when I shaved my beard off last week. You ever see this commercial? There's a commercial. I don't even know what it's about. I think it's pizza or something. But anyway... There's this couple, just a normal-looking couple, and they're sitting there in their living room or whatever, and he says, that's it. We're off the grid. And the next picture is they're all in this cave-like thing, and he's got this long, old, scraggly beard. And she says, you can order pizza, you know, off the Internet. He goes, that's it. We're back on the grid. And then, you know, so I'm back on the grid. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm just saying, God is so much more than this world wants us to believe that he is. He's so much more even than religion wants us to believe that he is. He's everything. And he wants to prove that to us every single day of our life. If we'll just get comfortable with him, if we'll just relax and realize we're at home, he's at home, it's all good in Jesus. Amen? God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord. Amen. Enjoy it. Keep your imaginations active and see God move in miraculous ways. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.